What are your favorite ways to get exercise, Chris? I run, I play tennis, and mm -hmm. I do push-ups. Sometimes pull-ups. Push-ups and pull-ups. Okay. And why do you do those things so specifically? So push-ups and pull-ups is almost completely, you know, it's like pectoral. I want uh, like I, I want to look relatively muscular. And, yes. And then running I do to keep my blood pressure down. Okay. Yes. All very beneficial things. All things that are beneficial for your body, like your yeah. physical body. Helping to produce Emu Think has mm -hmm. convinced me that it's really good for the body. Yeah. In a lot of ways. But did you know how good it can be for our brains as well. I just read this new book that came out. It's called Move the Body, Heal the Mind. And it's all about how exercise keeps our brains strong and resilient the same way that it does our bodies. Who wrote this book? It's written by Dr. Jennifer Heiss, rhymes with nice, spelled H-E-I-S-Z. Oh, we've had her on the podcast before. We have. That was way back on episode 15. What does Dr. Jennifer Heiss say about brain and exercise? She's led a lot of research that came up with some amazing discoveries. The clinical relief you get from exercise can be on par with the clinical relief you get from antidepressants. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah. Next, physical inactivity contributes to your dementia risk as much as your genetics do. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's enough to get me exercising. Yeah. For sure. I mean, Dr. Heiss says you can't change your genes, but you can change your lifestyle. So that's a very empowering piece of information to have. Absolutely. Exercise like your tennis and your running are actually helping you to become more creative and more focused. So exercise helps you... Helps you at work. It helps your attention span. Yeah, it actually, there's studies done in schools that shows that when kids take a break with physical activity, they are immediately more quiet and more focused in the classroom. Okay, that's amazing. Yeah. So it can actually help your studies. It can help your studies. It can help your workflow. Yeah. Amazing. Who is talking to Dr. Heist? She's talking to Dr. Andrew Miners. He's MedCan's clinical and product director of sports medicine, therapy, rehabilitation, and fitness. They're going to talk about her new book and the research that she leads that has uncovered the plethora of ways. Like there are so many ways that moving the body can heal the mind. Amazing. All right. I'm yeah. excited. Let's get to it. Let's do it. Welcome to Eat, Move, Think, everyone. I'm Dr. Andrew Miners, and I'm the clinical director of sports medicine, therapy, rehab, and fitness here at MedCan. And I'm speaking here today with Dr. Jennifer Heiss, the director of the NeuroFit Lab. Welcome, Jennifer, to the show. Welcome to Eat, Move, Think. Thanks for having me. And very much a congratulation on the publication of your new book, Move the Body and Heal the Mind. It's a great book. I really also enjoyed the storytelling that you did in it, how it was more like having a conversation with you as opposed to reading science. Mm -hmm. You integrated stories and people with science. It was excellent. Thank you so much. I guess it brings my first question up is, where did your interest in exercise in connection with mental health come from? How did you uh, mm -hmm. get to where you are in the, the making of this book? Yeah, so, well, it's, it's a bit of a personal story. My interest with exercise happened probably around my mid-20s. So I was in graduate school doing my PhD in neuroscience and studying how, you know, the fundamentals of neuroscience, how does the brain represent who we are as people, our memories. Mm -hmm. And it became very clear to me that something was not quite right with my own brain. I was having some very severe anxiety um, I went to the school doctor and was really reluctant to take the, the antidepressant. Mm -hmm. And on a whim, I borrowed my friend's rusty old road bike. And much to my amazement, the bike rides soothed my mind and quieted my anxiety. And so from that point forward, I, I was just fascinated with, you know, how does exercise change the brain? How does it promote mental health? And so not only did it shift a change in my personal life, but also in my professional life too. And so instead of just focusing on the fundamentals of neuroscience, I then became interested in how exercise changes the brain and focused my NeuroFit Lab research on that. Oh, wow. And so you weren't into exercise prior to that? That was sort of the triggering <laughs> moment? Well, you know, I had, it took me a really long time to find my footing with activity, with movement, with sport. And like from a young age, you know, I was overweight in elementary school. I wasn't very athletic. I always was, was health conscious, mm -hmm. but you know, it, it just really took me a long time. I tried to become a runner for a long time. I talk about that story in the mm -hmm. book. And so, yeah, to your point, I wanted to make 
it a story rather than just science mm -hmm. because I do have such a personal insight into how difficult it is to exercise and also how difficult it can be to live and learn to manage your mental health, but how powerful the effects of exercise can be. Mm -hmm. And so I think it, the messaging is really hopeful. You know, it, it's hard, but it's hopeful. And uh, hopefully it inspires people to move a little more. I think it will, and, and it did for me too. You know, I was really able to relate to a lot of the challenges that you described, especially in the beginning of the book in my own life and saying, okay, well, yeah, that's how I can see exercise can help me too. But you, know, you mentioned just there how it's difficult to start exercising. And for a lot of people, people find it hard. How do I get started? You know, I don't have the motivation. Mm -hmm. I don't have the time. So why is it so hard for people to start to exercise, to get into that routine? Yeah, well, partly the, the brain is to blame, actually. So the brain- At least I have something to blame. <laughs> <laughs> something to blame. It's not your fault. <laughs> You're up against some barriers here and the brain is one of them. So the brain, it wants to conserve energy and this makes us lazy. So mm -hmm. if we think back to when the brain evolved, it was at a time when we needed to hunt and gather our food. We needed to expend a lot of energy and resources were scarce. So the brain was designed to uh, conserve energy. And this, this was the most effective way to survive. But flash forward to now, you know, we can hop in the car and drive to the grocery store and food is plenty there. And so the need to expend energy for survival is really, it's out of the picture now, but we still need to move to be healthy. But the brain sees that as an extravagant expense. And so it goes out of its way to talk you out of it. So it, it'll say, you know, ah, oh, you don't have time. <laughs> That's one of the greatest excuses. Yeah. Or, oh, do you even have energy right now? Aren't you too stressed to exercise? And so this dialogue that plays out in our head can really deter even our best efforts, our best intentions to be more active. I've said all of those things to myself. <laughs> uh, maybe even today I said that. So, you know, an understanding that the, it's the, you know, the brain is somewhat contributing to why we find it so hard to move. Are there any tips that you can give, uh, practical tips and applications that we would need to get ourselves moving to break through that mental barrier, so to speak? Yeah, there's some really simple ones that maybe many people are familiar with, but the the idea of just like planning ahead is really helpful strategy. Mm -hmm. And this is so simple, but you know, put it in your calendar and make it an appointment that you adhere to in the same high regard you adhere to all your meetings and appointments. Mm -hmm. You know, so block it off, make the time. Otherwise, it's like an impromptu meeting. Who has time for an impromptu meeting? Not many people. And so if we if we just hope to fit it in throughout the day, it's not gonna happen. So we need to carve out that time. Another thing that really helps is having a plan and just putting that plan in the calendar too. And so when your lazy brain's like, oh, do we have time? You say, yeah, it's right there in the calendar. And then when the lazy brain says, oh, it's too hard, exercising is hard, you can say, well, today's plan is not that hard. And so this, for me is the biggest trick just it's so simple mm -hmm. other things you can do to help increase motivation is by pairing exercise with things you enjoy so even just listening to music when we listen to music and do things we enjoy it increases dopamine in our brain which is a rewarding neurochemical that makes us feel good okay. and makes us encourages us to do things so when we pair enjoyable things with exercise, they get wired together. So this piggybacks on a fundamental feature of the brain, neurons that fire together, wire together. And so when you couple things that you enjoy with exercise, it's sort of, you know, eventually that enjoyment uh, builds up for exercise and the motivation is there. So Those yeah. Those two excellent tips. Pair it with something you like and schedule it and sort of use your brain to override your laziness. Yeah. So this is, you know, using your rational thinking to override your sort of emotionally lazy brain. <laughs> <laughs> Getting into mental health and how exercise can link into mental health. Yeah. You mentioned, you know, anxiety, but also in your book, you mentioned depression a lot and, you know, they can be coexistent for sure. And so how does exercise help with anxiety? How does exercise help with depression? Yeah. So the benefits of exercise for anxiety are really incredible. So even just a single bout of movement helps to reduce anxiety immediately after. Immediately. 
immediately after. And the benefits grow the longer that you engage. So there's a really cool factor that is released in the brain from exercise. It's called neuropeptide Y. And this is a protein in the brain that gets secreted? Yeah, it's like a neuro, it's a neurochemical, okay. a neurotransmitter that okay. uh, interacts with regions like the amygdala, which is our fear center. Okay. And this helps to calm the amygdala. So it's not so vigilant or hyper alert to threats and detecting those. And so essentially this neurochemical, this neuropeptide Y resiliency factor, when we see higher levels of it in people who are protected from things like post-traumatic stress disorder. So there's research showing that veterans who have experienced war when they return home some will develop ptsd but not everyone will and the ones that are less likely to be protected are the ones who have more of this neuropeptide y and so the really amazing thing is you can build more neuropeptide Y in your own brain with exercise. And it doesn't have to be intense, like a light to moderate exercise will do, which is really helpful for people who are suffering from anxiety. And research in our lab has shown that uh, even just light to moderate 30 minute cycling or brisk walk is enough to reduce anxiety. And um, so that's really beneficial for the anxiety piece. Another interesting thing to play with with anxiety is a lot of people who have anxiety also have this anxiety sensitivity. Mm -hmm. And so what does that mean? That's essentially the fear of fear itself. Those being afraid of the symptoms you feel in your body when you're anxious. So racing heart, difficulty breathing, these symptoms can make us more anxious. And then it, it causes more and more anxiety and le often leads to a panic attack. And so for people who have panic attacks or panic disorders, exercise at an intense level can actually be really beneficial because it exposes us to those symptoms, racing heart, difficulty breathing, that we get from also from exercise. And so it acts like an exposure therapy. Mm -hmm. So in the book, I talk about each chapter ends with specific workouts. I really like that part of your book. Yeah, I think that's really makes it really special. I haven't seen that before. Um, it really required a lot of creativity to synthesize the research into aerobic and resistance. But one of the workouts is the fear buster, mm -hmm. which is, you know, it's a wellness walk. So a moderate pace walk. And then at the end of the walk, when neuropeptide Y is fully infused in the brain, you do a sprint. Mm -hmm. And so the sprint can be just like a few seconds, just enough to get that, to feel your heart racing, to feel the difficulty breathing and then stop and, and see your body react to the stressor, the physical stress, and see it come back down. And that's exposing you to those feared symptoms. And eventually over time, you learn to fear them less, you know, and so you build up this tolerance and resiliency to stress. That's fantastic. You know, as a clinician, I see people that come in with fear of pain, kinesiophobia, we call it, or catastrophization of pain and symptoms. And it's very similar to what you just described. And so we educate them about pain and the sensation of the pain and expose them and realize that they're going to be okay, that ramp up and then recovery. So that's fantastic. Yeah, it's amazing. And I talk about pain, pain in the mm -hmm. book as well and kinesiophobia and this idea, yeah, that you know, sometimes our fear can get in the way of movement. You know, mm -hmm. on one hand, we have the biological inertia caused by the lazy brain, but we also have this psychological inertia caused by, you know, a fearful brain mm -hmm. that can prevent a lot of people from getting the exercise that they need. And so these baby steps need to be built in to start trusting that it's safe to move and then it's actually helpful uh, for you mm -hmm. and not harmful. It improves your mental health and the pain condition that they might be dealing with. Exactly, exactly. So that's anxiety. What about depression? Yeah, so the effects of exercise on depression are really remarkable. And so one really fascinating finding that just when I learned this, it blew my mind was that when we look at a head to head comparison exercise versus antidepressant drugs, the benefits for depression, it's technically a tie. Hmm. And so the clinical relief you get from exercise can be on par with the clinical relief you get from antidepressants. That's now, a huge I say piece that of information there. it is a huge piece. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, I do say that I like to always have a caveat there that, you know, people do need med some people need their medications. Mm -hmm. It's very transformative for them and they can benefit from exercise as well mm -hmm. with meds, like as as an add on mm -hmm. where exercise can help reduce 
the side effects they may be experiencing, and even their dosage. Yeah. But for, for one in three people who have depression, they don't respond to antidepressant drugs. So mm. what does that mean? They'll take the drug, but they feel no relief. Mm -hmm. They don't feel better. And for these individuals, exercise is the medicine they need. Mm -hmm. It works far better than an antidepressant drug. And research shows when, when individuals who have this drug resistant depression, when they enroll in an exercise program, they get s clinically significant relief from their depression, which is really wow. amazing. That is amazing. Just for these people mm -hmm. would be feeling, you know, overwhelmed, if not helpless, because they're not responding as they're told they should respond to that medication. So giving them an outlet or an additional way to treat themselves would be life changing in a lot of situations. Life changing. Absolutely. And it, it is, it, you can imagine how hopeless that would feel. Mm -hmm. And for a lot of these people, it's not just one antidepressant they try, but they might try mm -hmm. two or three or four. Can you imagine? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you think, well, what, what's wrong with me even more? You know, yeah. it's, it becomes this internalization. And, and so this message I think is so powerful. It's really, really important, especially now especially because this form of depression, this drug resistant depression seems to be related more to stressors, the cause of chronic psychological stress, how it, it starts to increase inflammation in the body, increases inflammation in the brain, and this leads to feelings of depression. And now, you know, we, we're coming out of the pandemic, mm -hmm. you know, we're in a war, yeah. you know, there, there's so much negativity in the world and, you know, we're layering that on top of our own life, mm -hmm. you know, and all the changes and transitions that are happening in our own life mm -hmm. that a lot of people have been feeling very overwhelmed and it's been for, you know, two years now. Mm -hmm. So this chronicity is what can help start causing depressive symptoms even in any people who've never had a diagnosis before. And so they're, they're new symptoms, maybe they're mild, maybe they're moderate, but this messaging that movement can help ease some of those depressive mm -hmm. symptoms and improve mood, I think is such a powerful one that we need to get out there. So yeah, so Jennifer, it was interesting that you talked about non-responders to medication. How common is exercise used to help those people? It's really powerful. And the way that exercise helps drug resistant non responders is because exercise is an anti inflammatory. And for a lot of people who have drug resistant depression, you know, the classic traditional view of depression is that it comes from a lack of serotonin in the brain. Mm -hmm. But for some people, this is not the root cause of their depression. Instead, it has to do with inflammation. Hmm. And so when our bodies are inflamed, that inflammation can get into the brain and it can start to mess with the neurochemicals and the processes we need to feel good. Interesting. And so exercise, because it's, well, at first exercise immediately is a little bit inflammatory, mm -hmm. but it has this anti-inflammatory cleanup crew that comes in immediately after you're done exercising and cleans up all the exercise, the inflammation from exercise and then some. And so you're left with a much less inflamed body. And eventually this helps to reduce the inflammation in the brain and to bring you back down to baseline and treats the inflammation that could be causing or the, the root cause of some people's depression. Wow. So that would be really powerful if linked with something like an anti-inflammatory diet. So using exercise mm -hmm. and getting proper sleep, everything you've talked about so far all comes together. Interesting. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned in your book, and I love the part where you outline specifically what some of these exercise routines, and they're very doable, even for beginners, even for people that have never exercised mm -hmm. before. What would a dosage look like for depression to have a positive impact? Yeah, the, the synthesis of the research shows that when it comes to using exercise to manage depressive symptoms, when we look at aerobic exercise, so there, we can have aerobic and resistance. Mm -hmm. And when we look at aerobic exercise, the duration matters the most. So for every additional 10 minutes that you do, you get a significant improvement in your depressive symptoms. So up to one hour. Mm -hmm. So the longer you can do your brisk walk, the better. Mm -hmm. When it comes to resistance exercising, and this this is like strength based exercise, mm -hmm. but also includes you know weight training, but also yoga and tai chi. Mm -hmm. 
um, for, for resistance training, it intensity matters the most. And so, um, yoga is extremely helpful, but if you add in some weightlifting as well, mm -hmm. that can increase the benefit. So 10% increase in workload can result in a significant improvement in your depression as well. And so I thought that was a really, really interesting finding and, and gives people that tangible thing to hold on to. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Would something like high intensity interval training be more effective than say going for a brisk walk for an hour? We've done some research on this. Mm -hmm. And so when it comes to depression, high intensity interval training can be as effective as just a moderate brisk walk. So okay. the, the research suggests that they're about the same. And so do what you like to do that, that with that. However, if if you're also suffering from anxiety or an anxiety sensitivity, because the two often go together, right? Mm -hmm. Anxiety and depression, then it may be better to stick with the moderate intensity because of the impact of the high intensity on the stress system. So if you're already really stressed out psychologically from mm -hmm. life, mm -hmm. and then you try to add on exercise stress on top Physical of that, stressor. there's just one stressor for all stress, you know, there's mm -hmm. one stress system for all stressors. And so layering stress upon stress can get you to your max tolerance quicker. Mm -hmm. And so it could, cause more harm than good. So yeah, it's a, it's very personal. Mm -hmm. um, and so for sure, high intensity is really good for treating depression. I have done research showing it's really good for boosting memory and neuroplasticity in the brain. But when it comes to anxiety, I caution okay. its use. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. You mentioned uh, previously about, you know, Barry breaking down barriers to exercise with one schedule and two pair it with something that you enjoy. And you mentioned in your book also about doing it together in a group based setting. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So it's also that social interaction that can be helpful for mental health in general. Yeah. And there is some research showing that, you know, especially for older adults, this was done in older adults who mm -hmm. worked out in a group setting and they get more health benefits when they work out in a group than alone. Mm -hmm even if they're not working out as hard, <laughs> which <laughs> I thought was amazing, right? <laughs> yeah. So um, it, it, it just shows the power of social interaction mm -hmm. and, and being together and working out together. Yeah, it's, it's really amazing. And so if you did that with your favorite music on, maybe you'd get a triple benefit. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so when we talk about dementia, right, cognitive decline over time, um, you mentioned in your book that the prescription that needs to be done primarily first off for both prevention and even treatment. Can you explain a little bit more about that mm -hmm. and that research that you've done? Yeah. So in our lab, we looked at, uh, we compared the effects of genetics versus physical inactivity on dementia risk. Mm. And this was done in 1600 older adults. Mm -hmm. And we found that physical inactivity contributed to dementia risk as much as genetics. Wow. So like sedentary behavior, too much sitting, right? Too much sitting and not enough movement mm. contributes to dementia risk as much as genetics. And so I have this saying, you can't change your genes, but you can change your lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And I think this gives a lot of people control and power over their brain health, especially for something like dementia, where there's no cure. Mm -hmm. And it is really scary. Um, and you feel a little bit helpless but when 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 you know that you can something as simple as activity level is such an important predictor of your future brain health fate then i think it's it really is empowering that is empowering like you think about the elderly population a lot of times they're isolated the depression might be coexisting because of that social isolation and they're concerned about cognitive decline and we and you mentioned in your book about community-based group exercise sessions should be everywhere because it not only prevents, my understanding, is it treats. Yeah. So, well, some of the most powerful studies have been done on people who have mild cognitive impairment. Mm -hmm. And this is a form of impairment. It's not quite dementia, but it's not healthy either. Mm -hmm. And individuals with, with mild cognitive impairment who exercise are actually likely, more likely to revert back to normal. Hmm than those who don't. This is just amazing evidence of the power of exercise. However, like you said, 
it's hard to exercise, you know, mm -hmm. you and I find it hard to exercise, but it gets even harder to exercise when you're struggling mm -hmm. cognitively. Mm -hmm. And so social support groups, structured exercise programs are extremely beneficial and important, I would say necessary for this group of people. I'm going to get into sort of the why and, and without getting too scientific, you know, talking about mm -hmm. neurotransmitters and neuropeptides. Why does exercise help? Is it because of these neurotransmitters that it's increasing uptake or is it changing our brains? You mentioned earlier briefly about neuroplasticity. Can you get a little bit more detailed into that? So exercise does so many amazing things for the brain. Um, one of them, and, and this is research we've done in our lab where we've shown that exercise improves memory. So mm -hmm. that was the high intensity interval, just high intensity interval walking mm -hmm. improves memory. And this, mm -hmm. we've shown this in young adults and older adults. And what's high intensity interval walking? Essentially, it's regular walking, but intermittently you're picking up the pace. Right. You know, to the point where it's difficult to the have a burst of speed walking. In between. Yes, okay. exactly. It's so simple. Everyone can do it. Um, and it's just a nice tweak to your regular walk. Um, and so why does interval walking boost memory so much? Well, new research shows that when we exercise at a vigorous intensity, it builds up this uh, lactic acid or lactate. Mm -hmm. And people have heard of lactate as this negative yeah. thing associated with burning lactic muscles. Lactic acid right? always sounds so negative. Yeah, yeah. so negative, yeah. like vilified really. Mm -hmm. And and recently we've discovered that actually lactate may be one of the greatest promoters of neuroplasticity in the brain. Neuroplasticity is the birth, well, it can be many things, but at its basic level, it's the birth of newborn brain cells in your brain. Growing new brain cells, growing new synaptic connections, so connections between brain cells, enhancing the brain's ability to communicate. Wow. And lactate helps this happen. <laughs> yeah, so it, it moves directly from the muscles into the blood to the brain, and it goes to this brain region called the hippocampus, mm -hmm. which is critical for memory function, and also this, the region devastated by Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. And so it, lactate gets there, and it starts growing new brain cells. Mm -hmm. And this happens throughout the life course. Not just when wow. you're young, but even when you're older. And and this is a really amazing finding. So I, I'm super excited about this research and pursuing it even more. That is huge. It seems like there's almost an unlimited list of the benefits of exercise from a brain's perspective. And who, who would have thought, right? You always think about exercise being good for your heart, good for your mm -hmm. lungs, good for your muscles and joints. But it sounds like it's where the brain is, where all the action's happening. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we, we, we revere the brain these days, right? It's, it's like one of our greatest features. And so uh, the benefits it has are just incredible from focus, creativity, yeah. memory, mental health issues. Yeah, it's just really fascinating. Flipping the coin then from the older population, what about youth? You know, uh, in your book, you, you talk about sleep a lot and how sleep is so important mm -hmm. to mental functioning and how exercising will help you sleep. And having better sleep will help you exercise. Mm -hmm. And so it kind of, I think you called it, you said a, a virtuous cycle. A virtuous cycle, right? Instead of <laughs> yeah. a vicious cycle, a virtuous <laughs> cycle. I like that phrase. Of all the benefits that you're talking about, is that does that hold true for youth? And if so, for, for example, the developing brain in a teenager, how important mm -hmm. then would exercise be to be, you know, outside of maintaining activity levels, how important mm -hmm. is exercise for, for the growing brain? For teen brain. It's so important, not just for the development of the body, but the mm -hmm. development of the brain too. And the teen brain is so vulnerable. It it's so vulnerable because the prefrontal cortex, which is our most evolved part of the brain, is still wiring up. It's mm -hmm. it's essentially not fully developed until we're around 25. Mm -hmm. And so the teens without this prefrontal cortex, it's harder to control impulses, to regulate behavior, to avoid risky situations mm -hmm. um, and make rational decisions. So that puts them at higher risk for uh, abusing, experimenting with drugs. It makes them at, at higher risk for having difficulty regulating their emotions, mm -hmm. which can lead to, you know, serious mental health issues. And sleep is, is a huge factor in this. So mm -hmm. For a lot of teens, they prefer to stay up late. I mean, anybody mm -hmm. who has a teen knows you stay up late. They 
struggle to get up in the morning. They're not getting the hours of sleep that they need a night. Mm -hmm. And then they can't think all day very clearly. They don't feel well. And it just creates, that's where that vicious cycle comes Mm -hmm. in, right? Mm -hmm. There's a study I talk about in the book where a high school had some teens come to school before school started at 7 Mm a.m. and had them run. (laughs) They just went for a run. Right, okay. At whatever, whatever, like a jog, whatever pace they were. And amazingly, the teens stuck with this. (laughs) And (laughs) and what they found was that they thought better during the day. They performed better. They felt better. And and then they slept better. They slept more deeply at night. And Mm -hmm. so it helps. It helps everything, which is really, really amazing. So, yeah. So for teens, Mm -hmm. um, it can be really beneficial for not only promoting sleep, but also exercise infuses the brain with dopamine Mm -hmm. uh, and the teen's brain it's so curious right it Mm -hmm. it wants to explore the environment it needs stimulation and Mm -hmm. novel experiences but sometimes if it's not getting that in healthy venues it goes to things like drugs and alcohol but what what the research shows is that teens who are physically active Mm -hmm. are less likely to experiment with drugs because they're getting the dopamine they need in a healthy way through activity Wow, that's fascinating. What a common issue with teens is too much screen time, which in, in essence is too much sedentary behavior, especially mm-hmm. if they're not in, mm-hmm. you know, organized sports or they're not into the athletic, you know, because some kids just aren't into sports. And you mentioned in your book that there's only three degrees of separation between sitting too much and dementia. It sounds like you could say the same thing with mental health issues in teens. You could, yeah, yeah. So so the research shows sedentary behavior is a is a big risk factor for dementia. And mm-hmm. but what happens is uh, when we sit for long periods of time, the brain gets starved of its vital nutrients, less blood flow to the brain, but also the body kind of goes into this hibernation mode. Right? It can lead to things like metabolic disorders like obesity, mm-hmm. type two diabetes, high blood pressure. And then with dementia risk, the high blood pressure starts to damage the small vessels in the brain, which can lead to vascular dementia, which is difficulty focusing and concentrating. And then eventually it can also lead to Alzheimer's disease, which really targets the memory, loss of memory. For teens, you know, sitting too much, it also would starve the brain of oxygenated blood flow, which would make it difficult for them to focus Mm -hmm. and think clearly. And so, yeah, it could... Uh, lead to mental health issues as well. And so performance for, let's say, you know, the executive or maybe the the teenager who's, you know, trying to get into that top school and university or trying to do their best on their next exam. Like if you said, well, as part of my study routine, I'm going to go to bed and I'm going to exercise. Would that potentially improve performance? Yeah. So there is several different ways you can do this to improve performance. One is every 30 minutes or after sitting for a little bit of time, every Mm -hmm. 30 minutes, take a two minute movement break. Mm. And so, like I said, prolonged sitting starves the brain of Mm -hmm. its vital oxygenated blood flow, which we need to think well, Mm -hmm. to think clearly, to be productive, to perform well. Mm -hmm. And so even just this simple movement break every 30 minutes, a two minute movement break can help the brain refocus. So research from my lab, we've shown that in university students who are doing an online lecture, Mm -hmm. if they take a short five minute exercise break midway through the lecture, they're less likely to mind wander during the lecture. Mm -hmm. They're better able to remember that information and this link between physical activity and academic performance is really quite a strong one. Wow. And so a lot of people think that activity may be, you know, oh, I don't have time mm-hmm. to exercise. I need to study. I need to get this deadline done. But it actually helps the brain work more efficiently and effectively. So you'll get your work done, but just faster. Mm -hmm. And another cool feature of moving and kind of breaking up your day with movement, even just a 10 minute self-paced walk Mm -hmm. is enough to boost creativity. So when you're working on that difficult problem, you may have experienced this before, you know, when you're when you're out exercising, sometimes you come up with your best ideas, yeah. right? Your greatest, yeah. most interesting ideas. And you're like, oh, okay, great. I finally saw when you're not really thinking about it at all. And so this idea that 
the brain needs this, you know, flexibility in what it's doing during the day to think more creatively and innovatively. That's fast. I often have really good ideas when I'm cutting the grass. So maybe that's why. Mm, yeah. yeah. So, so you don't have to think about what you're doing and you're walking at a brisk pace and you're exercising and you, exactly. your mind can wander and become creative. Wow. So it, it, it can improve performance, not only mm -hmm. manage mental health. It sounds like when we talk about exercise as medicine, that people need to get a prescription of exercise right when they're a kid. You know, when you see your pediatrician mm -hmm. as a young, you should be getting a prescription for exercise mm -hmm. for, for health moving forward. Talking about your, your sedentary, I, I, I see a lot of patients with spinal base pain, low back pain, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And I educate them on the difference between sedentary behavior and active behavior and that they should be looked at separately. It's not just about becoming more active. It's also about mm -hmm. minimizing or reducing sedentary behavior. It's interesting that it's going to be good for the body and the mind. That's an easy thing to get behind, right? Yeah. <laughs> I call them sitting mini breaks. It's kind of what you're mini saying. Breaks. Yeah, mini breaks. Yeah. So don't take a long like time. That. Don't disrupt your day. Yeah. And you can still yeah. keep your mind focused on what you're doing. Wow, that's fascinating. So I, I'd Jennifer, I'd love to get your a little bit more in depth on how we, we talked mm -hmm. about how you can become more, more creative. And I talked about how I get good ideas when I'm mowing the lawn. Can you give more insight into how exercise promotes mm -hmm. creativity? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so uh, the the prefrontal cortex, we've talked about mm -hmm. this already, it's the CEO of the brain, and it has essentially kind of two modes. So one mode is focus mm -hmm. and inhibit distractions, right? And that's what we need to, to stay concentrated on a, on a focus task. But it also has this other mode, which is mental flexibility. Mm -hmm. And this is where we come up with our, our creative divergent activities. Mm -hmm. And so we can use exercise and sport to train both of these modes simultaneously. So oh. if you're exercising on a treadmill, for example, mm -hmm. you may only be training your inhibitory control. Like imagine you're on your treadmill, you're like, oh God, when's this over? <laughs> you know, like That's you're me, inhibiting, right <laughs> you're inhibiting yeah. all these sensations, right? To stay focused mm -hmm. on, the, on the task. But when we exercise, like, and we, we cross train, for example, we add a variety of activities into our day, into our week. Okay. And uh, that helps train the brain to be more flexible. And mm. so when we train the body to be more flexible, we train the brain to think more flexibly. And there's this really cool research looking at sport. Mm -hmm. And so certain sports make us more creative. Oh, really? And it might surprise you. Yeah, so, that does surprise uh, me. <laughs> So um, when we look at the most creative producing sports, mm -hmm. it's not the artistic sports, mm -hmm. but it's net and combat sports. Really? Actually. And the reason why is because you're, you know, it's improvised movement. It's dynamic. You have to respond to your component. Mm -hmm. You know, you're thinking on the fly. You're thinking flexibly. Mm -hmm. And that really trains that part of the brain. Mm. Whereas when you're for artistic sports, like for figure skating or gymnastics, for example, these sports require you to memorize predefined steps and mm -hmm. execute them perfectly. And so you get really good at inhibiting, but not so, you know, it's not really training your brain to be more flexible. Right. That's interesting. Well, I was a football mm -hmm. player, so that's good because uh, yeah. maybe that was a good thing. <laughs> Outside of all the head trauma, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> the amazing thing actually is when kids, they play, you know, so there's this balance between structured activity and free play too, mm -hmm. which, which helps promote a more creative adult. So um, the perfect balance seems to be, you know, spending 50% of your time in structured sports and 50% of your time in free play, because it's at that free play where you could be creative, mm -hmm. you can make failures, you can experiment with body movements and ideas and, you know, strategies where that, that really helps train the brain to think that way. And so kids mm -hmm. who engage in 50 50 organized versus free play are more creative than kids that spend 70 percent of their time in organized sports and only 30 percent of their time in free play and so wow. i love that i love that finding too that it's, is a great it's just um mm -hmm. how do we get a free play gym for adults that's what we need <laughs> right just a big room with stuff to play with. Right? That, was that my, sounds fun. There's my next business project right there. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> We've covered a lot of ground already. We talked about how exercise can be beneficial for the treatment and management and prevention of anxiety. 
Same thing for depression, how it can be helpful in sleep and even in the elderly can prevent cognitive decline or be used to treat cognitive decline. And we've also learned that it can be good for the youth and the young brain in terms of helping its development and even improving performance for both the young and the old on tasks that require concentration, focus, or memory. Like that's a lot of information that I've already, <laughs> we've, I've already picked out of your brain. So you must have had lots of sleep and you must have done lots of exercise to have all of that in there. Because of all this insight here, what are the, you know, is there, if you had to summarize and let's say you have someone who's sitting, uh, you know, sitting in front of you and they saying, you know, I'm not feeling that great. I've got it feeling nervous. You know, I just, you know, like, as you said, in the pandemic, we've got these people that have been somewhat socially isolated in a lot of situations. They've reduced activity, you know. What would be your top three things be or practical applications? Say, hey, here's what I recommend. What would, what would you say to that if, if you can sum that up? Yeah. So actually, at the very beginning of the pandemic, we conducted a survey, a research study with 1,600 people. We just asked, you know, how are you doing mm -hmm. physically, mentally? And not surprisingly, stress was up, anxiety, depression were up physical activity was down. People who were able to maintain their activity level were faring be better mentally. Mm -hmm. And there was a shift in why people wanted to exercise. So mm -hmm. away from their physical health and more towards their mental health. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but there was this paradox, and this is getting to your question. Okay. There was a paradox where people wanted to work out to reduce their stress and anxiety, but their stress and anxiety were getting in the way and uh -huh. they lacked the motivation to do it which is a symptom of depression. And so we created this toolkit, which is freely available on our website, neurofitlab.ca. Mm -hmm. And this has the tips in it that you're seeking. So, you know, why, why is it hard for me to move and what can I do just to, you know, to, to break that inertia mm -hmm. and to overcome that, even just the mental barrier mm -hmm. of exercising. And so first off, the mantra should be some is better than none. Some is better than none. Good. Some is better than none. And so just consistency. It could just be once around the block. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. enough. Mm -hmm. it, and and one thing I find, I call it my mental health mode of exercise. Mm -hmm. And I have this negotiation with myself where, you know, I I take off the intensity, but I put in the duration. And okay. so if I have I have a 30 minute jog planned mm -hmm. for today and I'm not feeling well, mm -hmm. I'll say, OK, well, let's just do a 30 minute walk. And so I'll I'll start walking. And then it's amazing. Once you start moving, then you start feeling better and it becomes easier to to you'll, you'll surprise yourself once you, <laughs> you know, and usually yeah. I surprise myself and I'm running by the end. But yeah, that's it's super helpful. Thanks for that tip on getting the tips. That's excellent. And that some is better than none. Yeah, some is better than none. And we have this toolkit. It's it's freely available and downloadable. You could put it right on your fridge as a reminder. And it has the tips of like when you're feeling you don't feeling motivation. What are some of the neuro things that you can do to to get the benefits? Yeah, that's fantastic. Now, um, I want to know a little bit more about what's in your future. So, mm -hmm. you know, in your lab, what are what are some cutting edge stuff or what's 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 on your passion plate right now in terms of what you're working on? Yeah, well, so uh, we have some really exciting projects going on. So one is focused on students and, and kids with ADHD. So we're looking at the benefits of exercise mm -hmm. for helping to, you know, to level the playing, playing field in education for, for all students. Right. So that's a really exciting project. Another one we're working on is looking at this sport of orienteering. Have you mm -hmm. heard of this? Yeah, that's using a compass to go out and mm -hmm. find something or find your way. Yeah, yeah, so I have this student who's she's like a a world champion in in orienteering. Right. <laughs> and she's a, a student in the lab. And so we're looking at it as an interesting way to combine exercise with brain training. Ah. And it's like a it's it, you know, it really taps into the brain's evolutionary, you know, the setup pathfinding and finding your way. Interesting. Exactly. And so we think this is going to be big. It hasn't really been tested in the field yet. So oh. we're really excited about that. And then the work with lactate. Mm -hmm. I think that the research I cited before, most of that's just been done in, in mice, like animal models. It hasn't yet been done in humans. And I think this is a really exciting avenue that we're going to explore. Wow. Sounds exciting stuff. Uh, I can't wait to hear more about that at some future podcast, hopefully.
would love that. It's I've gained a lot of this and I really enjoyed your book and I hope uh, the listeners go out and get it. Uh, Move the body, heal the mind. It's got a lot of really interesting tips, very relatable. So thank you very much, Jennifer, for your time. I've learned a lot and this has been Eat, Move, Think and I've been Dr. Andrew Myers. That was our host, Dr. Andrew Miners, MedCan's Clinical and Product Director of Sports Medicine, Therapy, Rehabilitation, and Fitness, in conversation with Dr. Jennifer Heiss, the Director of the NeuroFit Lab at McMaster University. We'll post episode highlights and links, including a link to buy Move the Body, Heal the Mind, on our website, eatmovethinkpodcast.com. Heat Move Think is produced by Ghost Bureau. Senior producer is Russell Gregg. I'm managing producer Jasmine Ratch. Say hello and send us a tip or a suggestion by emailing us at info at eatmovethinkpodcast.com. Social media and strategy support is from Chantel Gertan and Andrew Imax. I'm executive producer Christopher Shulgin. Remember to rate and subscribe to Eat, Move, Think on your favorite podcast platform. Follow our host, Sean Francis, on Twitter and Instagram at Sean C. Francis, that's Sean with a U, and MedCan at MedCan Livewell. Follow Jennifer Heiss on Twitter at Jennifer H-E-I-S-Z. We'll be back soon with a new episode examining the latest in health and wellness.